Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I would like to welcome you to today's program, Scholarship versus Secrecy, Primary Sources in an Age of Misinformation, which is sponsored by ProQuest. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd point out a few features of the webinar software in the main area of the screen. Um, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and maybe a chat panel. If you don't see the chat panel, you can click the uh, little button on the bottom of your screen that looks like a dialog cloud. When that's blue, that's got the uh, panel open for you. And if you can't find the Q&A, next to that dialog cloud, there are three little buttons, and that'll pull up a menu which will let you find uh, the various options that you have as an attendee. All right. so. We will take some time at the end to answer as many questions as we have time for. So if you have questions for, for either Tom or Rick, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A module and we will get to as many as we have time for. All right, if you have any technical problems, if sound issues or anything like that, please use the chat panel to let me know and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Also note uh, that <clears throat> We are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And if you're on Twitter and feel like tweeting at us, uh, you can use the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars. Um, so if you've got another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews. All right, I think that's all the housekeeping stuff that we have for today. So I will turn the floor over to you, Tom. Thanks so much, Mark. It's a real pleasure and an honor. And I want to say my thanks to ACRL and Choice. We're really proud here at the National Security Archive to have won a, a couple of outstanding academic uh, titles, awards, and very proud of our partnership with ProQuest, which is putting into the hands of researchers and librarians all over the world these amazing primary sources. So a big thank you to all. You'll be hearing from Rick Nelson, our great product manager at the end, um, after I've shown some top secret documents and talked about some of the documents of the day. But let me just first, because you're hearing just the audio, um, give you, that's what I look like. And I'm not wearing a tie right now, but so there's a little verisimilitude loss. But this is when I was on the Colbert report, which is quite a hot seat, and he was asking me about, of course, declassified documents, and um, I was having a lot of fun, um, and he uh, teased me and said, oh, you know, you're a traitor for getting these documents out of the government, and then at the end, he shakes my hand and calls me a patriot, so classic Colbert treatment, but let me just segue to the document of the day uh, after I show you this is our promo for the Digital National Security Archive. What our partnership with ProQuest allows us to do is file freedom of information requests to keep breaking primary sources loose out of the government. There's no automatic declassification process that really works. If you don't ask for the documents and for the records, they'll stay in those vaults almost indefinitely. And so we're the we're sort of forensic historians or activist librarians. We're, we're filing requests and getting materials out and publishing in the Digital National Security Archive. And half of the net revenue comes back to us to support more freedom of information requests and more publishing. So we're really proud of that. It makes everything we do worth, it makes it all possible. So let me just give you the document of the day. I mean, this is the famous telcon, the, the rough transcript says the White House, pretty verbatim transcripts say historians of President Trump's phone call with the President of Ukraine back in July of the summer. And what's fascinating about it to us is that in DNSA and with ProQuest, we've published hundreds of telcons 
between the President of the United States and other heads of state. And this one's pretty different. This is you, you look at sections like that yellow section I outline, and it's about uh, digging up political dirt on an opponent. It's not about what are U.S.-Ukrainian relations about and how's your war with Russia happening on your border and what's going on with your, your economy. It's, it's personal politics. And that's an odd difference because here are examples of documents we've on the left-hand side, we've already published. On the right-hand side, two documents we've only gotten declassified just this year. And these are the conversations between President George H.W. Bush with President Kravchuk, um, with, uh, between President Bill Clinton and President Kravchuk. Extremely substantive. They're talking about ratifying the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. They're about uh, continuing the reductions of nuclear arms under SALT after the Soviet Union. They're talking about bringing in the G7 and the IMF to make sure Ukraine has enough balance of payment support. And the issues, you can see on the right-hand one, there's a wonderful handwriting out to the left where the reader of the telcon is congratulating the staffers. Say, wow, good stuff. These must have been talking points. And I think that's one of the sets of documents that both the House investigators and freedom of information requesters like us are going to go after, which is what were the briefing materials like going into the conversation that President Trump had? What were President Zelensky's briefing materials? What were they supposed to say? Because presidents generally get briefed very closely, and the note taker in these conversations tends to be a very substantive person. On the right-hand side, you see Rose Gottemuller. Rose is now the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. She's a very senior uh, U.S. government official, and so she's the one listening in and responsible for making this this transcript and making it accurate. And then it's circulated to other people who are not on the phone call, and that's where the handwriting comes from. Here's a couple more examples. Again, this is with President Kuchma, who was the next president of Ukraine in the 90s. Again, very sub substantive, talking about security cooperation, bringing the G7 summit at Naples to bring in international financial support for Ukraine, et cetera, and nuclear safety and the shutdown of the Chernobyl reactor. So you have very serious policy issues. That's the agenda. It points to a pretty uh, extraordinary contrast, if you will, with the sort of document of the month. Um, and here I want to take you behind our research process. So this is the actual whistleblower complaint from August the 12th sent to the chairs of the intelligence committees. And I'll just show you what we did last week when this document um, came out, was released by the Congress. Um, and we took it and started using yellow highlighters to focus in on what would make a good freedom of information request. So on the left-hand page, you see there's a mention of a specific State Department official, uh, Mr. Ulrich Brettbuehl, who was on the phone call, kind of designated State Department representative. We've just found out in the last couple of days the Secretary of State was also on that call. But what this means is the State Department would have a set of records around this call. They would probably have produced the talking points for the president. They would probably have their own notes, Mr. Brettbuehl's notes. They probably would have created a cable that they would send then to the embassy in Kiev to let them know what was said on the call. So we would ask a FOIA request for Mr. Breckfield's office files are before, during, and after the call. On the next page, you've got two other ambassadors, Volker and Sonland, who are both being sent to Kiev to follow up the phone call. Well, so we did more, two more freedom of information requests to state saying, okay, what about the Volker files? What about the Sondland files? Before, during, after the call, and then also their reports back on what were their conversations like uh, in Ukraine. So <clears throat> this is the, for us, a good freedom of information request is one where you have a date, you have a name, you have an office, you have an agency, and you can focus your request in not all records related to interactions with Ukraine in July, but rather specific people's office files. And over time, <clears throat> these requests will produce the primary sources that future scholars can use to figure out what was really going on there. Um, an impeachment inquiry will likely produce more documents, but this just gives you a sense. Here's the last page of the whistleblower complaint mentions <clears throat> 
that the Secretary of Energy was sent to Ukraine. So that's a Freedom of Information request to the Energy Department saying, okay, we'd like – how was Secretary Perry told that he was going to lead the delegation and what was his reporting back afterwards? And then there's a couple of meetings in that last paragraph on the, the 18th of July, a notice to agencies on the 23rd and 26th of July, <clears throat> an interagency meeting. It's about security assistance, so certainly both the State Department and the Defense Department would have people in that room. So this gives us two more freedom of information requests to say <clears throat> we want your what was the agenda? What was the participants list? What were your notes? What was talked about there? And did the phone call even come up? And so through the primary sources from meetings like this, you can really get your arms around decisions, a decision tree, a policy process, um, and get not only the context, but the history and the backing and, um, and actual evidence rather than the usual spin and speeches that are made, and everybody's trying to make their own points, but this at least grounds the conversation in actual documents. And so we couldn't, we wouldn't have the resources to file these requests and follow them up over months and years without the support that libraries provide us through our partnership with ProQuest. And that partnership also allows us to go to court. This is a case we brought together with the diplomatic historians. This is a Washington Post editorial back in May when we filed this in court because <clears throat> there were a number of media stories that in five different meetings with President Putin, the, the White House didn't take notes, didn't keep a record. And so this is a major issue for us because if there's no record of what was said, then it's not just that historians won't be able to do their work down the road. Frankly, the, the government today would not be able to do its work. What, what promises were made? What interactions? What transactions? So we were already in court with this case <clears throat> when the news came out about the Ukrainian documents and the attempt by the White House to restrict access. And so on Tuesday of this week, we went to that judge and said, could you do a temporary restraining order in the White House to say, while our lawsuit is pending, and we didn't even mention the impeachment investigation, but while our lawsuit is pending, whether we win or lose, you got to make them commit to save all the records around these phone calls, not just with Ukraine, but all these other foreign leaders, and any internal discussions of how do we restrict access, or will we even make type up notes of that meeting or who gets to see that telcon or that memcon. And so this was on Tuesday. We filed the motion for a restraining order. And yesterday afternoon, I can report to you that the Justice Department caved and submitted a two-page notice to the court and said that we have informed the White House that they are compelled by legal procedure to preserve all such records. And we can assure the court of that. So if any evidence comes out down the road that folks at the White House, you know, destroyed anything or or took things home, there will be a judicial remedy because we're already in front of a federal judge and she would get to order discovery and depositions. And this gives us <clears throat> another accountability tool, even though our purpose here is just make sure there's a record for the future, even if we can't get it in the near term because of secrecy rules, but we will make sure that it's preserved for the long term. So this, again, is a key activity of the National Security Archive and <clears throat> supported by the support of librarians all over the country. Um, this is an example of why these records of heads of state meeting are so important. This is a document we published in this great Soviet end of the Cold War collection that's in DNSA now. This is the last conversation at the Reykjavik summit, you got Secretary of State Schultz at the top, Gorbachev in the middle, President Reagan, who says, what about, why not get rid of all nuclear explosive devices they'd be eliminating? And Gorbachev, yeah, yeah, we could say that. Schultz said, okay, let's do it. This is as close as we ever got to a nuclear abolition, really getting, ridding the world of these city shattering weapons, nuclear bombs. And it's, it blew up. It didn't come through because of a lot of other issues that are captured in the documents that we published in the, the NSA collection. But to me, this is the kind of moment where without the MIMCON, the TELCON, the transcript of what was said, um, 
historians and even current officials don't know what's going on, what are the terms of the conversation. So in our collection with ProQuest, we published every single word that Reagan and Gorbachev and Bush and Gorbachev said to each other from 1985 to 1991. So it's a treasure trove of extraordinary primary sources. And the New York Times excerpted uh, one of them, that last phone call from Gorbachev to Reagan, to Bush, uh, as the Soviet Union was dissolving. So great historic moments. But this is, this is an example of what we have to do, the kind of slogging we have to do to get the full record on the table because the government has so many secrecy rules. The left-hand slide, 12 years ago, the government released this document but cut out the whole status column. And you can see it says B1. That's the first exemption to freedom of information. That's the national security exemption. And, <clears throat> excuse me, they cut out because those were the actual dates. This is a summary of the Israeli nuclear program, its progress toward a nuclear bomb. What we do, one of the things that we're able to do by just persistence, we have more than 30 years experience now of using the Freedom of Information Act, we see a denial like this and we know, you know something, we've got to get this re-reviewed. We've got to get another official to take a look at it. We've got to find all the other documents that mention specific dates and, and tell that in this case it was a State Department document, tell them, wait a second, this is really shouldn't be classified anymore. And when you do that and you do the appeals and you and you really and you know your stuff, you know your primary sources, you can get it released. So there's the status column over on the right hand side, things that they accomplished. They got uranium ore from Argentina. They completed the converting ore in 63. They were nearly completed in 65 for dealing with the fuel rods. They were for casting and machining plutonium. They had done that in 65. The last item we don't know about test. We, can, we don't detect a underground test facility. But this is sort of the steps that a country like North Korea, for example, would be going through before it can create a bomb. This, both of these documents, these are in our new nuclear nonproliferation collection because this history of how the United States tracked those wannabe nuclear powers, that, uh, that history matters today for what happens if Pakistan loses control of its, of its nuclear weapons, or, and what happens, how are we ever going to denuclearize North Korea? Those are big, um, big questions that go right to the heart of our national security and that of Japan and the world. So we keep working on this, filling in the blanks, and then sometimes we have items like this where a document comes back you see on the left hand side with a letter from <clears throat> the office of the secretary of defense and you can see highlighted in yellow it says look you know the national security council and the office of secretary of defense have no objection to declassification in full however mr mark patrick of the joint staff says oh it can only be declassified in part and mr patrick blacked out this whole chunk of the page but it looked familiar, the date, the signature looked familiar, and our nuclear analyst who curated this incredible nuclear proliferation collection went and did, did some back and found out that we got the document in 2010, released in full. <laughs> and it's a fascinating paragraph because it basically contemplates nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Hmm, successful war termination may require the seizure of strategically significant territory in order to end hostilities. So it's not just that we're going to irradiate and blow up all these Soviet cities, but we might have to land some of our troops on there. So it's a fascinating discussion. It's a document that shouldn't be secret anymore. There's no Soviet Union anymore. But all it takes is one official, Mr. Mark Patrick, to deem it classified, and everybody else folds, even though the National Security Council people and the Office of Secretary of Defense people are just as expert as Mr. Patrick at what should be secret and what shouldn't. So that's one of the reasons we exist to keep pushing that envelope, keep peeling back the black, keep challenging those single officials with bad judgment who say, no, 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 that should be secret. Scholars shouldn't get to see that, um, but we're going to fight and, and keep that stuff coming into the public domain. Here's another fun example. This is one of the documents in the nuclear collection, and it's a chilling document. It's historical. It's quite old, 1967. But what it says is, you know, you really ought to 
really ought to go get this briefing because what they figured out is they put three young PhDs in a room working part time with no access to classified information, and they achieved a nuclear bomb design in about three years. So it's not the knowledge of a nuclear bomb is not really a secret. Any competent physicist can work backwards from the fact of exploding. But the implications of this for proliferation, how are we going to then keep the bomb from circling the world from every two-bit dictator having a nuclear bomb and, and really threatening our security? So this is in our nuclear proliferation collection, and so is this ne next document, which is the, special, the CIA's analysis of all the countries that might end up with nuclear weapons. And they really did predict literally dozens, this is as of 1974, would have nuclear weapons. But what actually happened, only about 10 as of today including North Korea and Israel, Pakistan and India and China and France and Britain and us, have nuclear weapons. And the main reason why is that estimates like this seem to have scared the top officials so much. Oh, my goodness. You know, Portugal maybe is on the list. Oh, my goodness. Brazil. That the top officials went the extra mile to strengthen the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, to build multilateral groups like the Nuclear Suppliers Group to limit access to fissile material. All that is captured in the documents, and it's for as scared as we are today, and probably should be, about a North Korea and ICBM landing on Mar-a-Lago, for example, um, and doing a, a just extraordinary damage to the state of Florida and elsewhere. The reality is that the world is way safer today because of this kind of tracking of nuclear aspirations and nuclear materials, and it brought countries together to address this incredible threat, and it held down the proliferation in an extraordinary ways. So the, the collection you can use to track other countries' aspirations, you can use the collection to look at the history of multilateral diplomacy to prevent uh, proliferation, you can use the collection to look at uh, one of today's countries, today's threats like Iran or North Korea. Um, so there's multiple ways that this body of primary sources brings real evidence to both current and historical historical debates. So speaking of Iran, this is the Iran collection that's just about to come out in DNSA, and it's an extraordinary body of materials. I'll show you three or four of the highlights here just because they're ones that, that I think most American citizens would be pretty interested to see. This is the top diplomat, Bruce Langen, who was in Tehran, and he's writing back to Washington. He says, we've heard that the Shah wants to come live in the United States. He's fled Iran. He's in Mexico or Philippines or London or wherever, but he wants to come to the States. Please don't let him come to the States, because if he comes to the state, United States, the crowds here will go wild, and we'd, we're already under risk. People have already tried to storm the embassy. We really don't want to do that anymore. Please don't provoke that. Please don't let him come. And this is a fascinating document. It has no disk down this side, and what that means is not to be shared with the rest of the State Department. It's to go to the White House to try to tell the, high, the Secretary of State and the White House, please don't let him in. But in our document collection is this document. And this is a big new Brzezinski recommending to Jimmy Carter, ah, we should let the shy in. <laughs> yep, we decided to let him in. His health is bad. He will get some treatment in New York. So despite the top diplomat saying, please don't, internally at the highest levels, um, the U.S. government decides to let the shy in. And then what happens? The so-called students storm the U.S. embassy. And this document was shredded by the CIA station it was found by the students, so-called students, under the shredder machine. They spread carpets out in the motor pool area of the U.S. Embassy. They put the piles in different places on that, that set of carpets by where they were found in the embassy. They then called in their rug weaver specialist to feel the shreds, to separate the shreds into piles by the type of paper, the quality of paper, and then by the angle of the cut of the shredder. And only when they had separated out the pieces like that, they brought in their English speakers to pack, pair up letters on each side of a cut. And they pieced together about 100 volumes of these shredded documents, which 
which they published as documents from the espionage den, meaning the United States Embassy. And they held those diplomats for, what, 444 days, a real tragedy in many ways, although ultimately Carter's negotiation got them out on the day of Ronald Reagan's inauguration. But these documents are extraordinary. Um, I will say we published these documents in a ProQuest DNSA set back when it was Chadwick Healy. And we wrote a letter to the CIA our, at the advice of our lawyers to let the CIA know that we were going to be publishing these because these had not gone through an official declassification process. But in our letter, we informed the CIA that all of these volumes from the so-called students were available in the Library of Congress and in 30 other university libraries, in, but they had never been indexed and combined. And so we were indexing and combining. And I think it was the most effective sales and marketing letter we ever we ever sent out because the CIA promptly called Chadwick Healy and put it in order for the very first copy of the collection. And we were happy to assist the CIA's uh, declassification efforts over time. Um, here's another document from the Iran set. Again, this is Brzezinski to President Carter. What are we, what are we going to do about the Iranians? They're holding our hostages. What next? What are the things we can do? And then what are the other agenda items? We have a complete series of these called weekly reports, and they basically, in that series, describe in detail the complete foreign policy decisions of the Carter administration. You can see Jimmy Carter's handwriting down at the bottom right, and a little piece that's blacked out that's about a covert op operation possibility against Iran. So <clears throat> this document will be in our next Iran collection, and then we'll be going back over time to ask for that piece of black to get declassified. And with the passage of time, it will. Um, and here's a couple more from the Iran collection. This is President Clinton's outreach to Iran when a reform president, Hatami, was, was elected in, in the late 90s, except the, the message really bombed. It became a kind of a throwback in the face of Hatami. He basically raises an issue where the Revolutionary Guards have participated in blowing up the Kobar Towers. But he kind of blames it on Hatami, who was the political enemy of the Revolutionary Guards. If the Guards had had their way, Hatami would never be elected. So this message ended up shortcutting. We know from both interviews and from other documents that are in this collection. We've got the original message, <clears throat> but the message shortcut a possible uh, opening to Iran. This message did too. This was to President George W. Bush. The Iranians said through the Swiss and this is the American government's copy of what the Swiss gave the American government. Iran had said, <clears throat> we don't like al-Qaeda. They're crazy militants. They're a whole different form of Islam. We, don't, we think they're, they're infidels. And we, would like, to, we would like to work out with you on some of the issues of counterterrorism against al-Qaeda. It's fascinating because it's one of those what if. What if the U.S. government had not been involved at that moment in invading Iraq, for example, but rather saw the possibility for some diplomacy that might have some longer-term benefits against al-Qaeda? It's an interesting what if. Scholars of the future need to know that this happened and the response, the lack of response by the U.S. government. Um, and this next document is, again, one of those essential items. This is the most recent declassified national intelligence estimate about Iran's nuclear programs. That program is starting back up now with small steps that Iran is clearly taking to try to get everybody's attention and say, wait a second, folks, come back to the table. Um, we had a deal. The deal was the United States pulled out of that deal. Um, and now the, the danger is coming back. You can see this last, it's keeping open an option to develop nuclear weapons. Well, I think the world becomes way less safe if Iran is developing nuclear weapons and way more safe if Iran is embedded in a multilateral uh, treaty and negotiation. So it's a, it raises all kinds of questions about current diplomacy, but it also gives you incredible factual material about the development over decades of Iran's nuclear uh, intentions. So segue to Iraq. This is the internal U.S. Army history of the Iraq war, and this is the second volume on the surge and withdrawal. What's fascinating to us about it, this entire document, and the, we're going after the footnotes with freedom of information requests because there's specific titles and dates of documents. But in their conclusion, 
they basically say, and what's in yellow, the only winner, the only victor from our war in Iraq has been Iran, that it was emboldened and, and it's now expansionist because we got rid of their main check and balance, meaning Saddam Hussein. So it's really interesting to begin to understand international relations as this complex, you can't take out one place and change the world uh, without having all kinds of unintended consequences. Um, let me go on to a couple of other great examples. Here's, here's, we found through freedom of information requests that the CIA itself had done a whole series of these mea culpas. How could we be so wrong? On the one hand, the document suggests the White House, yes, was cherry picking intelligence about Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction. But at the same time, key professional CIA analysts who produced estimates like the one I showed you earlier on which countries might get the bomb kicked themselves afterwards in 2005 and 2006. How could we be so wrong? He didn't have WMD. And this series is fascinating because they basically say, look, whenever he was deceiving us, deceptions were perpetrated and directed, but we didn't get the reasons for those deceptions. In other words, CIA is beginning to understand Saddam lied and deceived about his WMD, but what he was lying about was he didn't have any more. <laughs> But he was in a dangerous neighborhood. A paranoid dictatorship wanted to protect that. Saddam wanted the Iranians to think that he had nuke or chem or bio capacity. And on our side, we read it as, oh my God, he's hiding a capacity. He was actually hiding the lack of such capacity. So what was fascinating to us just as scholars is you had an intelligence analyst going back to their own product over a period of years and questioning their own assumptions and looking at it in the light of the current evidence. So our Iraq war collections in DNSA have all of these mea culpa documents and have the studies from the Iraq study group showing there's no WMD and the internal debates of the policy around that. So you can draw your own conclusions. You can understand the intelligence process, the policymaking process, the problems with cherry picking intelligence um, and really get an appreciation for the professionals, the analysts. I give them a lot of credit. They were wrong, but they went back to try to focus on it and figure out why that was. So this is one of the fun items that's going to be coming up probably in a year in the Digital National Security Archive from ProQuest. This is one of, Ronald, uh, of Donald Rumsfeld's so-called snowflakes. Snowflakes was the word other people at the Pentagon gave them because document, little documents like this, one page, two pages max, sometimes one paragraph, sometimes one line, would cascade down from the Secretary of Defense's office on everybody in the Pentagon. And people would go, wow, oh, what do I do with this? And what we found, we had to bring a freedom of information lawsuit, but we're now upwards to over 50,000 pages of these. We're about to go through an indexing process for them to get them into Digital National Security Archive, but they're fascinating because some of them, the agencies write back with these huge long studies. Some of them, we just have notes at the bottom, what am I supposed to do with this? And some of them clearly set off an internal debate. And this one is fascinating just because he asked a key question on the second page. Are we capturing, killing, or deterring and dissuading more terrorists every day than the madrasas and the radical clerics are recruiting, training, and deploying against us? There's an underlying question that he's also asking, which is, in effect, are we killing them faster than our global war on terrorism is helping create them precisely by the sort of reaction to the, to the violence. And so this is a core question I think the United States government still doesn't know the answer to, and Rumsfeld is posing it back in 2003. This series, the snowflakes are going to be an extraordinary, almost chronological, almost hourly portrait of the entire period from George W. Bush's inauguration through the surge in Iraq and the and of course, including the Afghan war and all the other subjects the Secretary of Defense deals with. So basically will become an indispensable tool for any historians of the 21st century. Um, and that's next up. But I don't want to leave us with such a sad and sobering, are we killing people faster than we're creating them? But let's just 
end on a slightly lighter note this summer. You may remember a Facebook page signed up a half a million people to come storm Area 51 where the aliens are supposedly been hiding all these years. You may remember the great movie uh, Independence Day where the President of the United States is taken out to the desert in Nevada and taken to an underground and they have an alien in a in a bubbling water tube and he says, why was I never told of this? And his national security advisor says, well, Mr. President, you just weren't cleared to know. And that's kind of part of the problem with our secrecy system. Even the people who really need to know may not be cleared to know, and you have to keep pushing against the system. So this became a whole rage this summer, Area 51. And, and of course, people came to us, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, and gave us some credit. Public only found out that it even officially existed when our senior fellow filed a FOIA request and got the CIA's own history of its YouTube program. And, and this is what the history looks like. It's a fascinating document. Here's the cover page, Overhead Reconnaissance. <clears throat> we asked for it because we saw it cited in another CIA history. And the other history that was released said, well, this was a great account of all of our work to build the U2 and all that. And in this document was this fascinating map showing exactly where Area, 50, Area 51 was. But more than that, it explained why it was so secret and how so many conspiracy theories had been built over time about it. Because this is the place when defectors from North Korea or China, for example, flew to a Japanese air base bringing a MiG fighter with them. That MiG fighter would then be transported to Area 51 where they would put it through, test pilots would put it through all its paces, and we'd test our radar, and we'd test our detection systems, and we'd test our pilots against it. We figured out how the MiGs actually worked, but we sure didn't want the Soviets to know that we had a couple of their captured MiGs, but this made a huge difference according to this history in how Israel was able to have a, I think it was something like 200 to 1 shoot down ratio in the 1973 war uh, with Syria and Egypt, where the Syrians and the Egyptians are flying MiGs and the Israelis are flying, what, F-14s. And you have this extraordinary ratio because here the U.S. government had helped had figured out what the weaknesses were. And the other planes that were tested there were the ox card and our own stealth bombers. So very secret area, but now officially declassified. And I doubt that the aliens are there, but you can understand when you get into this kind of history of Area 51, how it's exactly the excessive secrecy around these kinds of operations and around these kinds of documents that give rise to conspiracy theories and to hyperbolic notions of what's there and aliens and test tubes and so forth. So um, it's a fascinating interaction between excessive government secrecy and this the rise of misinformation and its and its extraordinary spread via the, via the internet. So um, let me just end on a very positive note with another thank you to Choice and ACRL. This is the Digital National Security Archive and last year winning an Outstanding Academic Titles Award. And the graphic that we used for the full page in Choice Magazine is Fidel Castro meeting with then Vice President Richard Nixon. I mean, this is not the most well-known meeting. Only a few scholars knew about it, but we got the document declassified where Richard Nixon reports on what Fidel Castro is like. And he says he has those indefinable qualities that make him a leader of men. Whatever we think of him, he's going to be a great factor. He seems to be sincere. He's either incredibly naive about communism or under discipline. My guess is the former, et cetera, et cetera. It's a fascinating document from 1959, just months after Fidel comes to power, from a very astute political observer, Richard Nixon. Um, and this document and this set of interactions around Castro are the beginning of what it became our whole document collection on Cuba and the United States. And it went from these the early triumph of the of, of Fidel Castro all the way through the Obama opening uh, to Cuba with documents from every president had secret negotiations with Castro. And thank goodness, every president had really good note takers, even of the quality of Richard Nixon, writing down what was said. So not just for history, 
but also for officials who deal with Cuba policy. So I will leave it there. I'll turn it over to, to uh, Rick Nelson, our terrific product manager, to finish a couple of slides, and then I'll look forward to, to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. I, I, I'll speak just briefly so we can get to everybody's uh, questions. Uh, and uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about DNSA and, and let everyone you know, know that Tom and his, his expert staff of, of, of foreign policy experts and national security experts, they produce two DNSA collections every year. And there are currently 53 that are live. Uh, the 53rd collection went live just just earlier this summer, back in June, and uh, it, Tom alluded to it in his in his converse, in his uh, presentation. It's on nuclear nonproliferation. It is the uh, is the second installment of nuclear nuclear nonproliferation collections, uh, and it is uh, it is a fascinating collection that details U.S. government's concern about emerging nuclear weapons and its efforts to monitor those nuclear activities. Um, and it is, as I said, it is live now and available for uh, uh, for perusal. Uh, and coming up this December, uh, we have the extremely timely uh, collection on uh, the U.S. policy toward Iran. Uh, Iran is in the news pretty much every day now, and um, it, it is, you know, it, we have a long history with Iran, and this. This collection goes from it covers everything from 1979 uh, right up to uh, you know the, the time of the nuclear accord in 2015. Uh, it is a uh, it will be a, a, a tremendous collection uh, and and you can look for that to come out in uh, as I said December. Um, each of these collections within DNSA uh, there are 53 going on 54 and uh, all those collections they really complement one another. And uh, they, some of them work as, uh, as, as sequels, in a sense, part twos and, and uh, part threes. And, uh, and there are also thematic collections that sort of, that are thematic topics that sort of work together, whether it's Mid Middle East or nuclear history, uh, f taking f collections 53 and 54 and putting them into their, collect their, their uh, 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 topical area. Uh, but there are also, you know, there's topics, you know, like the, the Cold War and um, and, and many others that uh, sort of work together thematically. Uh, and I invite you all to review those collections uh, and the various themes in which they, they cover uh, on the, the, the libguide here that I've included the, ad, the uh, URL to right here. Um, and... Um, and so uh, I guess now we'll sort of turn it over to uh, Q&A and see what questions everybody has. I do want to let everybody know that we are, uh, we, we will, there will be a, uh, a recording of this webinar uh, that will be sent to everyone, I believe, uh, uh, in the next day or two. And uh, if, if people want uh, to see some of the slides, uh, they can contact me directly and, and see if, uh, and I'll we'll see about uh, if, we, if we can give you some of the slides. Absolutely. Um, so let's take a look at some of the Q and A. So uh, Tom, uh, one question I've, I have here is from someone: Is uh, uh, are these docs that you showed in your presentation only available through ProQuest? And I wonder if you'd like to address that. The those first several documents from the um, Ukrainian the Telcon and that whistleblower complaint are widely available through a lot of press sources. It's, I think what will be available through ProQuest and through the archives publications in the future will be the results of those Freedom of Information Act requests. And so <clears throat> when you see documents like that, uh, those internal er assessments of nuclear proliferation, a lot of those documents from this era, key era of the 50s and 60s when states were starting to get the bomb or trying to get the bomb, um, those are really unique materials. You might be able to find them if you spent a year or so going through the National Archives at College Park and the 
Truman Library in Missouri and the Eisenhower Library in Abilene and the Gerald Ford Library in, in Ann Arbor. But what our experts have done is combined this incredibly intensive archival research. So we're curating, pulling the most important items around decisions around nuclear weapons and our government's tracking of nuclear weapon states together with brand new releases through the Freedom of Information Act that would be um, when we make requests through FOIA, it opens the document for everyone, but it's very difficult to find. There's, a, as you know, a fire hose of information out there. And so what we've done with DNSA and ProQuest is apply the expertise of these extraordinary subject experts. So, for example, the curator of our U.S. Soviet collection, she got her undergraduate degree at Moscow State, bilingual in Russian and English, got her Ph.D. at Emory, um, and has worked on U.S.-Soviet relations for two decades, personally knows Mikhail Gorbachev, et cetera, et cetera. It brings a level, has published three books about these subjects. So she's bringing that kind of expertise to the curation to put it together. So you're getting a large mass of information, but it's the most valuable material, not just the administrivia and the stuff that you will find in freedom of information reading rooms and the like online. So that is, I think, an invaluable service. And the process then supports us, the publications support us to do new freedom of information requests that open this information for everyone. All right, all right, uh, fantastic. Uh, I have a question here uh, asking if there are MARC records available for each collection within the DNSA. Uh, there are. There are collection level MARC records for all 53 existing collections and, and there will be co MARC records for all you know forthcoming collections as well. Um, Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a question. Okay, uh, what what about the emails that are currently being labeled as classified after the fact to get Clinton on the status of the emails that were on her server? Can we classify things like that after the fact? When is it acceptable and when is it not? Uh, Boy, great, great question. Um, yeah, that's very much in front page news these days. Uh, the short answer is yes. In the executive order on classification, officials can retroactively classify a document that wasn't classified at the time. But there are conditions for that. That one, it has to be recoverable. That is to say that it's not out in the public. Uh, and I think for many of these documents, particularly because tens of thousands of the Secretary Clinton emails have already been released to the public, um, many of these messages may already be published. And so that would undercut, that would actually prevent them. They should not be able to retroactively classify. And second, the big problem, and I think you saw in one of my earlier slides, how it only takes one official claiming something is classified to override the group judgment, say, of the National Security Council staff or the Office of Secretary of Defense. One person can say, no, it's classified. That's a huge problem with the classification system because I think it was Senator Grassley of Iowa who, when he was first shown the a first group of of Clinton emails that the CIA was claiming was classified and the State Department said was not classified, Grassley said he was underwhelmed by the claims because most of those emails were simply people at State Department forwarding to the secretary who was traveling New York Times stories. But it just so happened to be New York Times stories about drone strikes in, say, Pakistan. Now, the drone program at that time was a deep secret. It was a highly classified program. But when a couple million people are reading about it on the pages of the New York Times, I don't think that's a basis for claiming classification. And I strongly suspect in this case, in a number of these instances, the State Department officials were using email just to alert the secretary and her traveling party, usually included her chief of staff and maybe her briefer on intelligence and maybe an area specialist or an ambassador to that region. And an email would come alerting the secretary's party that here's what the prime minister of Poland said yesterday and you're going to be in Warsaw tomorrow and you should just be aware of it. And I think there's somebody like that joint staff's joint staff official, Mark Patrick, 
who's saying, oh, that should have been classified, that should have been classified. Well, this was more than five years ago already. She's been out as Secretary of State for more than five years. And most classification stamps, like at the confidential level, are only supposed to last for five years. So I think it's a crock. I think it's a classic example of the security classification system shooting itself in the foot. They should not be spending their time going after emails that were not classified at the time by senior officials and sent to other senior officials who didn't see them as classified. Um, those security officials should be spending their time on the real secrets, and there are real secrets. There are real secrets like designs of nuclear weapons or a chemical binary warhead or a, a bottom line in a current negotiation or the identity of some brave Chinese person who's telling our embassy what's going on uh, behind the scenes and behind Tiananmen Square. So there are – that somebody would be killed if their identity came out. There are real secrets. That's where we're – we totally differ from the sort of Julian Assange approach of throw it all up against the wall. I think people can really get hurt as a result. But we argue that that percentage of the real secrets is pretty small. I think Governor Tom Kane, the Republican of New Jersey, who uh, was appointed to co-chair the 9-11 Commission, looked at all the Osama bin Laden intelligence. This is current, real-time, global war on terrorism intelligence, and he said – 75% of what I saw that was classified should not have been, and we would have been safer as a country if it had been openly available. And so I think that's a pretty fair estimate. About 25% of it are, is real secrets, but the other 75% really should come out in close to real time so that we can take actions as citizens to protect our country, protect ourselves, um, and know what the higher-ups are doing and holding them accountable. Okay, uh, and I, I have another qu a question here is asking, um, is there a way that we can find out um, which DNSA collections one's institution has purchased? I know we don't have all of them. Uh, I, I would say you, you should uh, contact uh, your library or your, your uh, reference librarians and have them uh, look at what they have. Um, alternatively, I would say I'd, I'd be happy if you if you reached out to me and you could email me directly at richard.nelson at proquest.com, uh, and I'd be happy to look up your institution and figure out which ones you have and don't have. Um, and also, if there if there are ones that you have, um, uh, uh, if there are ones that you if there are ones that you don't have and ones that you want, I'd, I'd be happy to. You know, provide you with some materials and uh, and help you make an argument to uh, to to your to your library to to acquire that one. Uh, so uh, uh, please, uh, any any questions at all, just uh, contact me, Richard Nelson at ProQuest dot com. Uh, and so, Tom, I have another one here for you. Um, uh, can you address the emerging issue of deep fakes as it problematizes archival work? Amen. That's a, that's a really – especially, I think, in the age of electronic records, we have – there's more and more premium put by us and inside the government, actually, on this kind of audit trail of the creation and maintenance and management of documents. So, for example, the computer system at the White House in which this transcript with the Ukrainian president – resided has very high level like code word tracking for who input anything on that document who read that document who downloaded did anybody print it out so you have a great deal of control inside the government on that kind of tracking which i think helps prevent the sort of deep fakes issue. I think it's a much bigger problem when you get to the video world and the media world where um, fake documents, fake videos, uh, the famous Pelosi slurring her speech video, which turned out to have been slowing down the audio track on an existing video. That is so easy to do, and there's so many technically proficient um, pranksters, and not just pranksters, people with ill intent. I think that raises a bigger problem. So I would just put in a plug for the Internet Archive, which has been a huge help to us in the way that it tracks 
uh, web pages and web publications over time. So even when government agencies pull down material they don't want to post anymore, like documents on climate change, that's one of our projects tracking American diplomacy going back to the Montreal Protocol under Reagan that saved the ozone layer all the way up to the Paris Accords. When agencies take down climate change stuff, we can quickly go to the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive and Brewster Colley and his com colleagues who can track that stuff and you can then create a kind of an audit trail. But I guess my great caution in all of this, and it's, it's deep fakes is not a new problem in the Internet age or the electronic record age. It's been a problem from the original, I think the oldest classified document we're aware of is a cuneiform tablet that was found in an oasis on the border of what's now Iraq and Syria, and it scratches in a little clay medallion that um, was enclosed inside another clay medallion, and the internal one said, kill this messenger. <laughs> So whoever was carrying the, the document to the king or the ruler, um, then uh, I guess that's the origin of the kill the messenger uh, uh, trope. But the, the, these are uh, – there were fake cuneiform tablets in the sense of orders that were faked to cover somebody's rear. Um, and we see that even today with memoranda that we – and we will often put those together with other memoranda. Some of them are – Sort of written for the file, and some of them are really decision points. And we interview the former officials for each one of these collections. We recruit former ambassadors, former diplomats, retired generals, others who were there, who were in the room. We've even taken these people to places like Hanoi to meet with General Jop or uh, Havana, Cuba, where we met with Fidel Castro, McNamara, and the Soviet generals who brought the missiles there to get all of their commentary to help us really – curate and select and make sure that we have the evidence that the participants also thought was valuable. And we've also found at all those ses settings that all those folks are constructing their own narratives. So the documents become a check on their own tail spinning or, uh, or weaving and kind of holds them close to the truth. It's not that the documents are the truth. They are evidence and historians, journalists, courts, We've all developed expertise and procedures over the years for weighing evidence against each other, even where there are contradictions, and figuring out and getting closer to the real history and what really happened. So that's the, that would be my answer on the deep fakes. It's been a perennial problem uh, going back to the Babylon, and it's only getting worse because of the tools, IT tools available to the fakers. So. Stay on point, stick to the evidence, talk to the experts, use DNSA and other tools to see documents. What we can say is we've authenticated these documents. These are not fake. These really came from the U.S. government through the following process, and we can name either the file they came from, or the office they came from, the number of the Freedom of Information requests that produced them. So you got a real providence trail, and that's our antidote to the, to the fake news uh, disease. Uh, and that 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 feeds, leads perfectly into the, the what I'm going to will just say the last question. Um, uh, how do you think freedom of information uh, requests can function to affect the current political and government climate? Can they quench political misinformation, or on the contrary, promote rumors? For example, Area 51. That's a that's a great question. I would say that like with Area 51 the Freedom of Information request actually solved a bunch of the mysteries and the, and the misinformation. And so it gave people, serious scholars and students and citizens, well, here's the real secret history. Here's how the CIA chose this spot. So I think it, that works in the opposite direction. In today's political climate, Freedom of Information requests are often used as a tool, as a political tool, weaponizing FOIAs. That's not our role in the world. The National Security Archive does it for the history, does it to stake out the record to preserve it against current dangers to the record, and then tries to ensure by our institutional memory and our expertise and our curation that these primary sources get into the hands of the people that need them, use them, will teach with them, will research with them, and ultimately build all of our libraries and all of our institutional memory. So and I just want to thank you all for participating in that, which I think is a pretty heroic cause. 
All right. And and with that, I think we uh, will say thank you so much, Tom, for um, taking the time to present on all of this really fascinating material today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate the opportunity. Great. And to you, Rick, thank you for facilitating the questions and for uh, giving us a little information on the DNSA, um, on on the, the ProQuest products. We appreciate that. Thank, and thank you for having us. I appreciate it greatly. All right. So before everybody takes off, I would just remind um, all of you that we did record today's program. So be on the lookout for that follow-up email tomorrow morning. And if you have a minute, we would really appreciate it if you would take some time to fill out the survey that you see um, in the chat box there, hopefully. Um, we really appreciate the feedback on these webinars. So take a minute to give us a little bit of it. Um, and we'll use it to try and make them better all the time. All right, so thank you everyone out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope the rest of your day is great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.